Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a very fascinating series following basically the teachings and the script from the book, The Great Controversy. This is lesson number 11 in that series for June 15 of 2024, entitled The Impending Conflict. And if you've read the book, Great Controversy, you recognize that that's one of the chapter titles. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have come here once again to talk about these imminent and very important events that could happen at any time in the near future. Help us to understand them and what they might imply for our lives and for the lives of the people around us is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our world is becoming connected, not politically or physically, <laughs> but through the internet and through various devices, making it po possible to contact almost anyone anywhere almost instantly. It's amazing, as those of you who know about that. There is a medical device. I'm not sure exactly how this relates, but it's possibly related. A medical device called a biochip or a very chip that can be implanted under the skin of a person which contains most of that patient's medical history. Thus, it uh, has been suggested by some that this will eventually become a required uh, be, be required for everyone, and with that, the government will be able to trace everyone everywhere. And that's I, the mark of the beast. Sometimes. Yeah, but I... Some have thought that the number 666, in, as in Revelation 13, 18, might apply to the Masonic Order, the Illuminati, or some symbol of the United Nations. Okay, having finished that kind of stuff, what do the Bible study guides say, Jim? The aim of this week's lesson is to reveal a coming conflict over worship. Satan will challenge God's authority by attempting to undermine God's law. Specifically, the Sabbath will become the center of a global conflict over worship. Satan hates the Sabbath because he hates the Creator. He will use coercion, pressure, and force to break our commitment to Christ. There will be a collision of beliefs, beliefs over the true and false day of worship. God's final appeal is an appeal to faithfulness to Christ despite persecution, an economic boycott, imprisonment, and a death decree. This week's study emphasizes Jesus' strength to, uh, excuse me, to take us through the earth's final conflict. This is from the Bible study guide. For okay, so let's be very clear on a couple of points that are sort of hinted at by that paragraph that I think we need to be very specific about. This is not a question about one 24-hour period being different than another 24-hour period. What this is about is what those 24-hour periods stand for. Do you believe that God is the Creator? Okay, that, what does that rule out? Abiogenesis, most of the ideas of evolution, etc. So, those people will be on worshiping on Sunday. The people who believe in the creation, eventually, will be worshiping on Sabbath. That's the implication. So, what we're saying here is it's not the 24-hour period that's the big issue. The big issue is what does that stand for? What does it mean in your life? There are some people who feel that the book of Revelation is full of mysteries that no one can understand. However, by careful reading of the book, and if one understands the symbolism from the Old Testament and the New Testament, by the way, I just have looked at some evidence. One person did a lot of careful work and decided that there were at least 600 references from the Old Testament found in the book of Revelation and someone else suggested it could be even more than that. So there's a lot of symbolism from the Old Testament. If you look at that, it becomes clear that the world is coming to a time when the conflict between Christ and Satan, which began in heaven over worship, will come in its final climax. So that brings us to our next big question. What do we mean when we say worship? Does it mean, do you go to a church building a certain day of the week? No. The, world, the word worship means what is most important in your life. 
what is most important? What do you hold of great worth? W worship. Worthship. Worthship. Yeah. Wor the word worship is a shortened version of worthship. What's worth something in your life? That's the question. Jennifer, I'm going to ask you to grab that next one there. Revelation chapter 14, verses 7 to 10. He said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. And I'm going to interrupt, interrupt for just a second. It's interesting, you can't really do this in English, but in Greek, when it talks about the time for, the, for Him, to, this one says for the time for Him to judge. It could also say the time for Him to be judged. Mm -hmm. we, make our, we are making our choices every day by how we relate to God. So we are judging Him. Some people are judging him false. Some people are judging him true. So it's, it's both of those. It's, it's, okay, we're judging him, but he will ultimately judge us. Okay? A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, whoever worships the beast in its image and receives the mark on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. In the good news oh, translation. Okay, and those of you who are here know that uh, all the way through the Bible, starting in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Judges, all kinds of places of the Bible, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that God's anger is simply His turning away in sorrow and sadness from those who don't want Him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. And those who persistently refuse yeah. God's approach. Yeah. So what evidence do we see in the world around us that there's a growing conflict between God's side as revealed in Scripture and the devil's side as revealed in rising atheism, evolution, and modernism? Remember that the Sabbath comes every week and continues to remind those who worship God of his creative powers. Satan hates that. Consider the following scripture passages. Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. And Revelation 14, 12, this calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Okay, Myra, you want to... Yes. Bring us the words from Ellen White there. Yes, from the Great Controversy. The Sabbath will be a great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth, especially controverted. controverted. Yeah. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who do not serve, those who serve Him not. While, this observance, while the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be uh, an avowal of avowal, allegiance. Yeah, of allegiance to the power that is in opposition to God. The keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. And of course, that's from our book, Great Controversy, which is the basis for our lessons this quarter. As the whole world seems to be following the devil and his selfish ambitions, as suggested in Revelation 13, we'll see those verses a little bit later, a final group of faithful people will have the faith of Jesus and be faithful to Jesus, Revelation 14, 12. Bible-believing Christians were warned 2,500 years ago of what was coming. Daniel 7, 25. Uh, let me read that. He will speak against the supreme God and oppress God's people. He will try to change their religious laws and festivals, and God's people will be under the, His power for three and a half years. What about evolution versus creation? Wouldn't that be part of the change of, of laws? It wouldn't, has, they're not necessarily religious. Yeah. It, it's just uh, there. It's it's a part of the big pa the whole package. Yeah. You'll celebrate uh, transition day or whatever they're doing. Yeah. I mean, th that's a violation of uh, of the way things function. Mm -hmm. 
I mean... So this war between God and Satan over the, how the universe is going to be controlled has been ongoing, especially since the time of Jesus. When Jesus died that unique and meaningful death, Satan knew that his side would eventually be defeated. However, that certainly has not stopped him from trying to defeat God's side. So what are we told in Revelation 13, 3 and 4 and 7 and 8? And here's our verses about Satan's side. Remember, Revelation 13 is Satan's side, and then Revelation 14 is God's side. Okay, Jim? When I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, it had ten horns and seven heads. And each of its horns there was a crown, and on each of its heads there was a name that was insulting to God. The beast looked like a leopard, with feet like, like a bear, and a mouth like a lion's mouth. Now let me interrupt for just a second. Uh, where have we run across leopards and lions and bears in the past? Daniel, wasn't it? Daniel. Yeah, Daniel 7. These are symbols of ancient empires. Okay, so we're going to see what, what that might imply. Go ahead. The dragon gave the beast okay. its own power, his hey, throne. Just, let's be just clear about this as we move along. I'm sorry to interrupt again. Who is the dragon? Satan. Satan. Yeah, Revelation 12 makes it very clear. We're, so we're talking about the Satan himself, okay, gave the beast his own power. Go ahead. Okay, and see, one of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Everyone worshiping the worship dragon, that is Satan, because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshiped the beast also, saying, who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? It was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them. And it was given authority over every tribe, nation, and language, and race. All people living on earth will worship it, that is the beast, except those whose names were written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the lamb that was killed. Oh, what are the, what are the um, uh, process theologians would do with that text? Oh. Who knows? Just ignore it, I guess. Huh? Yeah. It's much fairy tale. Satan though. builds up two human organizations to support his cause. Some people have called this, uh, some people have chosen to call this Satan's trinity. They include Satan himself, the leopard-like beast from the sea, and the lamb-like beast from the earth. Revelation 13, well, 12 and 13. Religious persecution is certainly not new. After all, that was why Cain killed Abel. Notice what Jesus himself, Peter and Paul said about religious persecution. Jennifer? From John 16, verse two, you will be expelled from the synagogues and the time will come when anyone who kills you will think that by doing this, he is serving God. Now just look at that, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. They will kill God's faithful people <laughs> thinking they're serving God. That's exactly what they were doing to Jesus, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. From Matthew verse t um, chapter 10, verse 22, everyone will hate you because of me, but whoever holds out to the end will be saved. From the Good News Bible. And then 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How many does that include? Get ready, I guess. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So if I'm not being persecuted, I'm not uh, in union with Christ? Well, you, maybe you just haven't had your chance yet. In 70 years, huh? Yeah. Um, and then finally, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. My dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful test you are suffering, as though something unusual were happening to you. From the Good News Bible. We know that the disciples themselves, probably all except John, died the deaths of martyrs. The Roman Empire declared Christianity to be a, Christianity to be a foreign, a forbidden, I'm sorry, religion, and anyone who did not abandon Christianity in favor of worshiping the empress was to be killed. Times of religious persecution waxed and waned through the Dark Ages. As we read in Revelation 13, that persecution will come to a final climax. Revelation 13, verses 15 through 17 say, the second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. Okay, death sentence. Go ahead. 
We haven't had that locally recently, have we? No. But in other countries it has. Mm -hmm. The beast, and in other times, the beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark, that is, the beast name or the number that stands for the name. Good News Bible. Okay, here is the big question for our lesson this, this time. How could Satan possibly get the whole world to worship him? It would tickles be their ears. Right hmm? It tickles their ears. It tells them what they like to hear. Okay. It would be difficult today, but times are changing rapidly. Well, let's, let's, let's dig into that a little bit more. God's foundation of his government is love. His government is based on love. As you look at the world today, do you see the people, I'm sorry, remember that Satan's main motivation is so. selfishness. God's more foundation is love. As you look at the world today, do you see the people being motivated by love or by selfishness? You also need to put in that uh, it's freedom. Yeah. If they, if, if most people, they, well, they talk about liberty. Liberty is not freedom. Freedom to choose is crucial. I mean, the last thing the Creator wants is somebody to submit because they're coerced. Yeah. He wants you to freely make a choice yeah. and, and, and an educated choice. He, he, he spends a lot of time, and what, what was his experience there at the cross was education. It wasn't a well, payment of a penalty. So, who co coerces between these two sides? God never coerces. Exactly. He doesn't force anybody. Satan will coax and try to deceive and everything else, but if all else fails, he will try to force. We just need to be aware that that's the way these two sides work. But what do most people, uh, most religions peddle is that God punishes and God destroys. And that is a lie. The truth is that he, God doesn't do that. So you got truth, you got freedom, you got love, and if you understand those, then you can begin to understand God, which is who is love. Okay. Revelation 13, 3 tells us that one of the heads of the leopard-like beast would be wounded, but then it would be healed. The prediction was clearly fulfilled when the Pope was taken captive in 1798 by Napoleon's general Berthier, and then died in prison that year. <clears throat> the healing, excuse me, the healing occurred in 1929 when Mussolini restored some property to the papacy and restored his power to a certain degree. Let's be very clear. As we read, we read earlier, Revelation 13, 1 and 2 tell us from where the power behind these three satanic agencies comes. Let's read that one more time since it's so important. Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2. Then I saw a beast, a leopard-like beast, coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. On each of its horns it had a crown, and on each of its head there was a name that was insulting to God. The beast looked like a leopard, with feet like a bear, like bear's feet, and a mouth like a lion's mouth. The dragon gave the beast his own power, his throne, and his vast authority. Okay. What kind of leadership did we, do we know about in those ancient kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece? They were kings. They were kings. Anything else we know about them? Warlike. So, yes. And... They, all, they, almost all of them either wanted to be regarded as a god or at least treated as if they were gods. So we're talking about that kind of power going on here. Uh, and that vast authority does not end there. We see some, we read some of these sec sections of Revelation, we read some of these sections uh, of Revelation 13 earlier. Now let's follow a little bit later in Revelation 13, 11 to 17. <clears throat> we read some of this before, but let's be very clear. Then I saw another beast, a second beast, a lamb-like beast, which came up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb's horn, and it spoke like a dragon. Now, does a lamb remind you of a dragon? 
Not exactly. Never heard a dragon speak. Well, <laughs> Puff did, but... It used the vast authority of the first beast, the leopard-like beast, in its presence. It forced the earth and all who... So when he's, he's forcing people, whose side is he on? Satan. Satan's side. It forced the earth and all who live on it to worship the first beast whose wound had healed. This second beast, the lamb-like beast, performed great miracles that made fire come down out of heaven to earth in the sight of everyone. Now, we don't know for sure what that means, but some people have suggested that was the development of the atomic bomb, maybe. And it deceived all the people living on earth by means of the miracles which it was allowed to perform in the presence of the first beast. Okay, have we got to that, gotten to that stage yet? Is the United States performing miracles using the power of the devil? Not that we're aware of. Okay, let's put it that way. Not that we're aware of yet. Okay. The beast, the lamb-like beast now, told them to build an image in honor of the beast, that is the leopard-like beast, that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast, the lamb-like beast, was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. Hmm. Talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. What do you think is implied by that? Okay, the first beast, we, 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 we believe that's the Roman Catholic entity. It talks where we understand that, and we're in less than a couple lessons coming up, we're going to see how one of the things that the, the, the dragon, well, the, no, the second, the first beast says, but how does that relate to put to death? Is that just, okay, you do this, otherwise you'll be put to death? Possibly. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having the, this mark, that is, the beast's name or the number that stands for the name. And I've wondered, how does the death sentence have, relate to the can't buy or sell? I mean, if you're dead, it doesn't really matter too much, does it? Yeah. How do you think that authority will be exercised in our day? Think about, you know, I, it, just, it just amazes me that almost any difference that comes up between people, we have to go to court. We have to have a, a judge has to decide this or that. I mean, things that people ought And we have to appeal that, and we have to appeal that again and yes, again exactly, and again. Exactly. And then yeah. you end up at the top one where they can't, one of them calls themselves, they call themselves a justice in the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, what right justice means righteous. Mm -hmm. uh, call themselves a righteous. Remember, uh, what's his name? Uh, Rehnquist. Mm -hmm. Somebody called him a judge. No, I'm not a judge. I'm a justice. Mm -hmm. I'm righteous? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> what happens to people's minds when they get Okay, them? so. But anyway, um, now we got a Supreme Court, quotes, justice that can't define a woman. Mm -hmm. And we settle for that? What are you going to do? Are you going to stick your neck out there and, and, and to use it as for target practice? No. Yep. <laughs> but that's where we're, the way we live. Change, think to change times and laws? Daniel Knight, Okay. Jim, you have some background in law. You think that these discussions about the Sabbath and Sunday and all the implications of it could end up in the Supreme Court of the United States? Could it end up in the International Court of Justice of the United Nations? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> We're living such okay, here's topsy turvy the, time. Here's my here's my final question on that. How do you think the two sides would be represented at such a hearing? <laughs> two sides. I mean, we, we, we really need a Jesus and a Satan, don't we? Yeah. yeah. These are the two sides. And Jesus doesn't operate that way, so it 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 it, it has to happen through education over a period of time. Well, maybe going to the Supreme Court would be a very educating experience for the nation and the world. Yeah, one of the things that Ellen White talks about is there'll be a lot of people who will learn the truth because either it will be argued in the newspapers or on TV or something like that, or uh, in courts. One, oh. thing, one thing I believe you can count on 
is you cannot count on, you not, cannot count on the U.S. Supreme Court to make the right decision. Yeah. Look at what they did during World War II with, with the Japanese with, and Manzanar. Mm -hmm. Okay. They had the opportunity. They wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. The only, I learned from a, a, reading a case about, uh, called uh, Gideon's Trumpet. And the case was, uh, you can't put a guy on, on trial for, uh, on a capital case without uh, having assistance of counsel. Anyway, w what was instructive to me is the only way you get in the U.S. Supreme Court is what is called by a writ of certiorari. Mm -hmm. Certiorari is purely discretionary. What that means, if they don't want to hear it, you're stuck with the harm that you were given d down at the lower courts. Mm -hmm. Simple. Yeah, of course. They won't touch they, it. They, well, there's, and there's some wisdom in that. I mean, they're, they're way behind already. If they took everybody who wanted their case to go to the Supreme Court, where would they be? I, that's where we live. Yeah. Satan correctly interpreted the prophecy that God gave Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15. From that day to this, he has done everything he could to prevent the Messiah from coming and to prevent God from succeeding. He tried to destroy the Jewish nation by having all the baby boys killed while they were in captivity and slavery in Egypt. Later, he tried to destroy the Jews in the days of Esther. When the Christ child was finally born, he tried to destroy him through the work of Herod the Great, killing the Jewish boys in the region of Bethlehem under the age of two. Okay, what evidences do we have for that? Where are we now? Revelation 12, mm -hmm. verses 3 to 5. Another mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a huge red dragon with several heads and ten horns and a crown on each of his heads. With his tail, he dragged a third of the stars out of the sky and threw them down to the earth. He stood in front of the woman in order to eat her child as soon as she was born. Then she gave birth to a son who will rule over all nations with an iron rod. But the child was snatched away and taken to God and his throne. Okay, so it's, if you know the biblical record, if you know history even, that could only apply to Jesus. There's nobody else that could fit that. So, so why, why does it describe Jesus as ruling with an iron yes. rod? Ah, that's a, a misunderstood term. The iron rods were, uh, were used, they had, had an iron tip, it was, the whole rod wasn't iron, they had an iron tip, and that's what they used to fight against wolves and lions and things like that to protect the sheep. I mean, imagine trying to fight against a sheep with a piece of wood or something like that. So if you had a, if you had a thing with an iron tip, two things, it would give you better traction if you're going up a steep hill to use as a, as a walking stick, but more important than that, it would give you a chance to have something more effective in, in, in beating off the... Coyotes or the, wolves or... Coyotes, whatever. wolves, lions, bears. Not everybody is like David, you know, <laughs> or, saw, or Samson, right? Okay, so what do we know then about the birth of Jesus? Um, from Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 to 18. When Herod realized that the visitors from the east had tricked him, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its neighborhood, who were two years old and younger. This was done in accordance with what he had learned from the visitors about the time when the star had appeared. In this way, what the prophet Jeremiah had said came true. A sound is heard in Ramah, the sound of bitter weeping. Rachel is crying for her children. She refuses to be comforted, for they are dead. Wow. So how and when did the Roman Catholic Church gain its great power? From the Bible study guide, about this beast power we're told, the dragon gave his power, his throne and great authority. That's from Revelation 13 too. This prophecy was precisely fulfilled hundreds of years later when the Roman Emperor Constantine moved his capital from Rome to uh, what, and this is just to interlude there, Byzantium. Yeah. Byzantium, uh, which became known as Constantinople and is now Istanbul. Yeah. So Constantine moved his capital from Rome to what came to be called Constantinople in modern-day Turkey. 
This left a power vacuum at the former throne or seat of the Caesars, the imperial city of Rome. Thus, pagan Rome gave the beast its seat or capital city. Isaac Bacchus stated, quote, by removing the seat of the empire to Constantinople, Constantine made way for the Bishop of Rome to exalt himself above all men upon earth and above the God of heaven. Uh, that's from uh, the sources given there. Mm -hmm. According to Thomas Hobbes, quote, the papacy is no other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof, close quote. Okay, so what they're saying is that... And all that's from Bible study guide. Right. Quoted in the Bible study guide. Yeah. What they're saying is that all of that uh, has, um, you know, that the power that was once centered in Rome, part of it went to Constantinople, but a lot of it remained to Rome, and it was sort of sucked up by the Pope. What identifying marks can we read in Revelation to describe the leopard-like beast so we make sure we're not misunderstanding something here? Well, let's see. Revelation 13, verses 1 and 6. Then I saw a beast, a leopard-like beast, coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. On each of its horns there was a crown. On each of its heads there was a name that was insulting to God. It began to curse God, his name, the place where he lives, and all those who live in heaven. Okay, so in name insulting to God, there's another word for that, what is it? Blasphemy. Blasphemy, okay. So how could the Roman Catholic Church be accused of cursing the name of God or practicing blasphemy? Look at John 10, 33 and Luke 5, 22 to see the Bible's definition of blasphemy. So we'll look at those verses right now from our Bible study guide. I mean, I'm sorry, from our Good News Bible. They replied, we do not want, this is the, the religious leaders in Jesus' day talking to him. We do not want to stone you because of any good deeds, but because of your blasphemy. You are only a man, but you are trying to make yourself God. Thus, the biblical definition of blasphemy, one of the definitions at least is, someone who claims to make himself God. In Luke 5, 21, the teachers of the law and Pharisees began to say to themselves, who is this man who speaks such blasphemy? God is the only one who can free of sins. And remember he told the, the young man who was let down through, his, through the roof to be healed, your sins are forgiven. And then he said, oh, by the way, since you think that his disease is because of his sins, then you believe that he has, his sins have to be given before he can stand up and walk out. Okay, so be healed. <laughs> your sins are forgiven. <laughs> your sins are forgiven. So this, thus the biblical definition of blasphemy is anyone other than God who claims to forgive sins. Okay, can we nail that down? The Roman Catholic Church has two interesting doctrines that the church calls, I'm sorry, the Bible calls blasphemy. One, it claims that its priests have the power to forgive sins in confession, in the, or in the confessional, they would call it. Two, it claims that the Pope has the prerogatives of God on earth. So is, are those blasphemy claim, blasphemous claims? And prerogatives means to take the place of? Yep. For many years, from 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D., the papacy exercised great authority over most of the Western world. When the Pope was taken captive and placed in prison by Napoleon's general Berthier, it seemed like the papal authority was gone. But today, the Pope is looked, on, looked to by many as a possible world leader who could pull all the conflicting elements of our world together. Pope Benedict XVI declared in a speech on June 6, 2012, to, move, to more than 15,000 people gathered in St. Peter's Square. Jim? Sunday is the day of the Lord and of men and women, a day in which everyone must be able to be free, free of, for the family and free for God. In defending Sunday, we can defend human freedom. Okay, now that was originally stated as they mo no stop, noted up there on his speech to, in St. Peter, Peter's Square in June 12, 2012. 
Uh, but I went out and I found it. It's at that website. We won't have time to look it up right now, but it was repeated a few months later in the court in, in front of the, the um, church in Milan, Italy. The, the catechism says Sunday is the day that follows the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have it right so, here on the phone. Yeah, if you, um, well, you can look at the place there. You could see, make his claims. That very statement, exactly as quoted there, it was repeated in Milan. So that site, it says accessed October 10, uh, 2022, but recently it's not available. No, I know it's, but if you look there down below, I looked it up today. At that other site, it is available. Not at the original site that is quoted up there, but at that, so that's why I put that one in there. You can, you, you have to go down a ways. It says, moved. look down to paragraph, huh? Okay. It's been moved. Huh? Well, this is, a, this is a repetition. The first time he made it in St. Peter's Square, and then a, a few months later, he made that statement in Milan. So it's not, but it's, so it's the same statement, but made in a different setting. By contrast, the book, The Great Controversy of Baal and White, tells us a different story. Jennifer, I think that's yours. From Ellen G. White, those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. Ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. In legislative halls and courts of justice, commandment keepers will be misrepresented and condemned. Yeah. Wow. To people living in the United States and those who are familiar with the freedom of its First Amendment, it might seem that such a scenario is impossible. However, look how fast our world is changing. Look carefully at what the Bible says about the beast that comes up from the land, the second beast, the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13. Reading again, some, some repetition of some more verses, but this is, this is the key to our lesson this time. Again, Revelation 13, 11 to 18. Then I saw another beast which came up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb's horns and it spoke like a dragon. It used the vast authority of the first beast in its presence. It forced the earth and all who live on it to worship the first beast whose wound had healed. This second beast, that is the lamb-like beast, performed great miracles. It made fire come down out of heaven to earth in the sight of everyone. And it deceived all the people living on earth by means of the miracles which it was allowed to perform in the presence of the first beast. I'm gonna interrupt for a second now deceived by means of the miracles. What do you think, how is that going to work? Mm, miracles are going to have you think that it's coming <clears throat> from God, but it's... Yeah, probably. Go ahead. Continuing, uh, this is in halfway through verse 14. The beast told them to build an image in honor of the beast, that is the leopard-like beast, that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast, that is the lamb-like beast, was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all who would not worship it. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hand, on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark, that is, the beast name, or the number that stands for the name. This calls for wisdom. Whoever is intelligent can work out the meaning of the number of the beast, because the number stands for a human name. Its number is 666. Good yeah. News Bible. Okay. Wow. <coughs> the Bible Ira? Study Guide says, the first beast rose up out of the sea. The second beast comes up out of the earth. The sea represents peoples, multitudes, <coughs> nations, and tongues. The earth then represents the sparsely populated area of the world. The second beast arises near the close of the prophetic period during which the first beast exercises authority. That is, it rises to prominence around A.D. 
uh, I wanted to say 19, 1798. Yeah. So Revelation 17, 15, our verse to support that, what about the waters? The angels also said to me, the waters you saw on which the prostitute is sitting are nations, peoples, races, and languages. The United States precisely fits this description. It declared its independence in AD 1776, adopted its constitution in AD 1789, and was recognized as a world power by the late 19th century. John continues, he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon, Revelation 13, 11. Horns in Bible prophecy symbolize power. Unlike the first beast, this beast has no horns, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, no crowns on its horns, suggesting it is not a monarchy. The two horns represent the two primary governing principles that are the sources of the United States power and success, political and religious liberty, from our Bible study guide. Okay, is it really possible that the lamb-like beast could speak like a dragon? Okay, we've had just two questions. The first question is, could it be possible that everyone would worship the dragon? This, that is Satan. And we've hinted that that means everyone will behave selfishly. I wonder if that could happen. <laughs> Excuse me for laughing. I'm sure it would be easy for us to be selfish. <laughs> yeah. So It'd is it really... not to. Yeah, is it really possible that the lamb-like beast could speak like a dragon? Do we see any hints of that? What kind of change does that suggest? Is it really possible that the apostate Protestant churches of the United States could form a union with the United States government to try to force everyone in the world to worship the papacy and the devil? I mean, that's what it says. Let's not, let's not beat around the bush. That's exactly what it says. Worship the papacy and the devil. In Daniel 3, we read the story of the three faithful young men who refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. If his, if his deceit and pleadings are ignored, the devil will eventually use force. However, God never uses force. Notice these comments from, from Ellen White. Jim, I think that's yours. God never forces the will or the conscience, but Satan's constant resort to gain control of those whom he cannot otherwise seduce is compulsion by cruelty. Through fear or force, he endeavors to rule the conscience and to secure homage to himself. To accomplish this, he works through both religious and secular authorities, moving them to the to the enforcement of human laws in defiance of the law of God. <coughs> Ellen White, Great Controversy 591. Okay. In order to endure the trial before them, they must understand the will of God as revealed in his word. They cannot honor him only as they have they can honor they can him. only as they have the right conception of his character, government and purposes, and act in accordance with them, but not those who have fortified None but, but those. none but those who have fortified the mind with the truth of the Bi truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict, Great Controversy 593. Okay. I, I hope the rest of you were, had to memorize that when you were in school somewhere. Hardly anybody qualifies under that. Yeah. Phrase. Well, we should. That's the, maybe that's why we're still here. You, I bet you can't find a, 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 a more than a handful of, of churches that that, that uh, would embrace that oh, paragraph. Churches, yeah. Okay. Well, there's the goal, folks. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, you want to pick it up? Sure, from uh, Ellen G. White from The Great Controversy. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible, and the Bible only, as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. Now, that shouldn't be too surprising. Where have we heard that story before? I mean, that was the rallying cry for the reformers, wasn't it? 500 years ago. Well, does that mean it couldn't happen again? Okay, go ahead. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. 
Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, in its support. Amen. Wow. So, so we shouldn't determine truth by a vote of the majority, is that correct? No, that's... We shouldn't decide what, what we're going to believe as, as God's word. Mm -hmm. and you, I hope you can see obvious, one thing that jumps off the page at me is, okay, how do we make political decisions? By majority rule. By majority rule. And what does this thing tell us? How do you find Religious truth? Decisions are not by majority rule. Truth is not discovered by majority rule. So that's going to lead someday to a very clear parting of the ways. Anything done by committee is going to be of far lesser stature and, and farther away from the truth. Well, the, so long as your Bible is standard, that's going to have to be the... Yeah, but what Bible? Yeah. I mean, you get uh, anything done. It, 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 the King James was done by a committee. Mm -hmm. The Good News translation is done by a committee. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's, if it's done by a committee, it's going to be feminized, and it's going to be down probably below the median line of, of quality. Okay, well, that's one opinion. Gordon, it's your turn. From the Bible Study Guide, Biblical prophecy forewarns that the long con cosmic conflict between the two opposite irreconcilable forces, that is God and the devil, is drawing to a close and will culminate in a final battle. This last battle will be over issues of authority and worship. Who will sit on the throne of the universe and who will receive the glory due the creator, the provider and the savior? For these reasons, the conflict will involve the Sabbath, God's symbol of all his power as creator, provider, and savior. The rebellious force will be led by Satan himself. While Satan has tirelessly worked throughout history to recruit adherents, his main focus has been the church. Unfortunately, the traditional church compromised and became Babylon or be came like Babylon is what they should say, yeah. symbolized by the beast uh, from the sea. Satan gave this beast its seat of authority and its power, and it stands on Satan's side in the final battle. We, as we've already seen, Revelation 12, 14, and Revelation 17, 3 to 6, what happened to the woman who represents the church? Remember, she flees to the desert where she's being helped and so forth by, by God. And then a little while later, we come to Revelation 17. What do we find out? The same woman in the desert is now riding on the, dragon. the exact same, well, the devil, basically. The exact same red beast with seven heads and ten horns that she was fleeing from. A righteous woman, the righteous church, flees into the wilderness and comes back compromised. A prostitute. Yeah. In the continuing from the Bible study guide, in the end times, the dragon also will succeed in attending to his side the most attracting to it. attracting to his side the most prosperous nation on earth, the United States of America. This nation, born out of centuries the centuries long yearning of persecuted Christians to find a place of religious safety and freedom, will compromise, as did the papal church before it in the old world. Thus, America will fulfill its prophetic role as the beast from the earth, becoming a global leader in the final battle. Wow. Continuing in the Bible study guide, but God has never been without a people in the great controversy. Mm -hmm. To the end of the conflict, he will always, he always will have a people, a faithful remnant church, or at least a faithful remnant. Yes. And maybe not, <laughs> not, able, a church may not be able to survive. Yeah. God's remnant church always has acknowledged him as king, worshiped him, and kept the commandments and the principles of his kingdom. God's faithful remnant people will reverence the Sabbath and honor him as creator and king of the universe. The end time remnant will not, their end time remnant not only will worship God as their personal savior, but also will expose the confederacy of evil publicly. The remnant church will call the entire human race to return to God and worship him. 
despite the efforts of, of the dragon and the beasts from the earth and from the sea, the victory will belong to God. Amen. Teacher's Bible Study Guide. So how can we identify the beasts and clarify the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? The Bible Study Guide says, some theologians have claimed that the first Adventist pioneer's identification of the beast from the sea with the Roman Catholic Church and of the beast from the earth with the United States were conclusions dictated by their socio-political context. So Some just of, out of their time, you know, yeah. this was the situation in their day, yeah. okay? Some of these theologians then call for the Adventists to move away from these initial positions and find more other more relevant spiritual or political forces in their own times that would be better fit that would better fit the descriptions of the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. Mm -hmm. However, we need to emphasize two important points. First, while the Adventist pioneers did look at the fulfillment of prophecy within their historical context, they consistently followed historicist principles of prophetic interpretation, that is, interpreting prophecy by associating symbols with historical events, people, and nations. They also identified the fulfillment of the prophecies in harmony with the holistic Bible system of teaching. Okay, so there was first one. They, they, yeah. they said, that's basically saying that our interpretation has to be based on Bible truth and the things we've learned from the Bible itself. Okay, okay. second? Second, as God's prophet for the rem remnant church, Ellen G. White clearly has warned us against abandoning, the, abandoning our original prophetic interpretations regarding the two beasts of Revelation 13. She is especially concerned that Adventists will fall into a trap of thinking that the Roman Catholic Church is now changed and no longer the tyrannical beast of the, from the sea, thus necessitate, necessitating the search for another candidate for this post. <laughs> search for another candidate for yeah. this post, huh? The following quotations from the, her monumental book, The Great Controversy, are remarkable and clearly Milligate, mitigate. Mi mitigate against... Militate, anyway, but oh. same, same idea. Militate, yeah. Okay. Against the, such a course of action, so... So the Bible Study Guide then quotes Ellen White from several pages of the Great Controversy. We'll pick up a little bit of that. Romanism is now regarded by Protestants with far greater favor than in former years. And those countries were Catholic... And so now we're going to talk about two different groups of of countries. How many, think about the world. What part of the world would you say is still dominated by the Roman Catholic Church? South America. Central America, South America, yeah. And some of so Southern Europe. Southern Europe, yeah. okay. Those are the main places, okay. And those countries with the, where Catholicism is not in the ascendancy, and that would be all the rest of the world, and the papists are taking a facilitary course in order to gain influence, there is an increasing indifference concerning the doctrines that separate the Reformed churches from the papal hierarchy. The opinion is gaining ground that, after all, we do not differ so widely on vital points uh, as, he is, as has been supposed, that a little concession on our part will bring us into better understanding with Rome. And I'm sure everybody in this room recognizes that the Church of England has said that you can worship in Catholic, the Catholic Church or worship in our church, no difference whatsoever. The, some of the Lutheran churches, the Lutherans have lots of different splinters and so forth, but some of the Lutheran churches have said, well, yeah, we remember Martin Luther, but yeah, those differences have sort of faded away, and so now it's fine for us to just worship with our Catholic friends. Martin Luther would be... Turn over in his grave. Yes. The defenders of the papacy declare that the church has been maligned and the Protestant world uh, are inclined to accept the statement. Many urge that it is unjust to judge a church of today by the abominations and absurdities that marked her reign during the centuries of ignorance and darkness. 
They ex excuse her horrible cruelty as a result of the barbarism of the times and plead that the influence of modern civilization has changed her sentiments, right? Yeah. What does Ellen White say? Jim, I guess you get to get that next one. But Romanism as a system is no more in harmony with the gospel of Christ now than it, at any former period in her history. The Protestant churches are in great darkness or they would discern the signs of the times. The Roman church is far reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase the power in her power in preparation for the fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all the, that Protestantism has done. Catholicism is gaining ground upon every side. See the increasing number of her churches and chapels in Protestant countries. Look at the popularity of her colleges and seminaries in, the US, in America, so that so widely patronized by Protestants. At the growth of the ritualization... Look at the growth. Look at the growth of ritualism in England That's and the I Protestant defections about. and frequent defections to the ranks of the Catholics. They, these things should awaken the anxiety of all who apprise the pure principle of the gospel. Ellen White, Great Controversy, 565, 566. Okay, Jennifer, do you want to take the mm. next one there? We're going to have to probably stop about partway through it. Okay. The Roman Church now presents a fair front to the world, covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelties. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. The papacy that Protestants are now so ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation, when men of God stood up at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity. She possesses the same pride and arrogant assumption that lorded it over kings and princes and claimed the prerogatives of God. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. Okay, we're going to have to stop there. Uh, in 1999, hope, Pope John Paul made an attempted okay. apology. It's time for us to close. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for this privilege we have of looking at these very crucial truths that will make such a difference in the soon years to come, we hope. Um, may we represent you correctly in what we do and say as we meet here and as we live our lives each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.